church, in the room and online. How is everyone today? Why don't you type it into the chat? And if you're in the room, I don't know what you can do about that, but type in what you're believing for the Lord to do today. You can whisper it to someone in the room from six feet if you want, but God is in a good mood today. God is still on the throne. Jesus' blood has paid for everything that you need today. And I just really felt today as I woke up to lean into Romans 8 with you. And this is what it says in Romans 8 in the Passion Translation. Who could ever separate us from the endless love of God's anointed one? Absolutely no one. For nothing in the universe has the power to diminish his love towards us. Troubles? Eh. Precious? Eh. And problems are unable to come between us and heaven's love. What about persecutions, deprivations, dangers, and death threats? No. For they are all impotent to hinder the omnipotent love of God. Yet even in the midst of all of these things, this is what he says, we triumph over them all. Morgan legitimately was. For God has made us to be more than conquerors and has demonstrated his love, um, our glorious victory over everything. So now I live with the confidence that there is nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from the love of God. I believe today, wherever you are, if you're in your living room, if you're driving in your car, if you're in this room, God is about to release an anointing of his love on your life. And this love is not a weak love. This is the same love that broke Paul out of prison. This is the same love that fell on the disciples in a a chaotic uh, Roman-filled world and caused them to be filled with power and love that that shifted the entire world. And and we are believing today that God's going to touch you in your home and God's going to exalt your head in triumph. So I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to get into worship. Are you ready? All right, here we go. Father, we just want to thank you that before the world ever was formed, you had your eyes on every person. You you had your, your son already planned to die for every one of us. And Jesus Christ, we uh, thank you that you are the same yesterday. Position. You are the same today and you are the same tomorrow. That Jesus right now, your love is filling everyone's home, everyone's, yeah. everyone's place. And Lord, I pray for a spirit of triumph Three. to break out. Three. I pray for a spirit of love to cause triumph over everyone's life. And we just humble, humble ourselves before your amazing throne right now. We humble ourselves before your amazing face. And we thank you, Father, that the best is yet to come. Yeah. Let's worship. Amen. Amen. Let's lift our hands wherever we are and let's give Jesus everything this morning. Turn one and one is live. Go ahead and turn on lyrics. The lyrics are on. All right, we got Follow Fresh with Emmy. Six. I told you. Six is live. <laughs> we got four, two. Expose down just a little bit. Four is live. Yep, that's good on two.
five. Coming back to six. Six is live. Alright, picking it up. Five and five is live. Wait on it one, wait on it one. Come to one and one. Perfect. Yep, 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 yep. Come to six. And six is live. Come to three and three. Look at five and five is live. Four, four is live. One and one is live. Come to five. Five is live. Six and six is live. Three and three is live. Come to five. Five is live. One. Five, five, and five is live. Come on, four, and four is live. Five, and five is live. Three, three is live. Come on, one, one is live. Slow down, slow down. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Look at a five. Six and six is live. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Coming to five, five is live. Looking at two. Five is live. Three. Three is live. One and then five. One is live. One and five. And five is live. Nice, nice, nice. Number five. Five is live. Looking at one. Going to two first, two, one, and one is live. Five. Five is live. Number six. Six is live. Nice, nice, nice. Coming to four. Four is live. Go to Morgan. On four, go to Morgan. Uh, a little slower next time. Coming to three, three. Coming to five. Five is live. Six. Six is live. Coming to one. One is live. We're going to two, two, five, and five is live. Come wake me from my sleep. through the caverns of my soul. Four and four is live. Can I make an adjustment on six really quick? Okay. Give it a one. Going in. And one is live. 
Five, five is live, looking at six, and six is live. There's going to be a lot of guitar show, too. Now you tell us. My name. <laughs> five, um, one, one, two, two. If this guitar comes up, it's not my fault, but it is my fault. Coming to five. Five is playing on Jared. Coming to four. Four is live. Come on, sing it. One. One live. Looking at six. Six is live. Nice. Three. Three is live. Five. And open up the heavens. And five live. Five. Five is live. Three. Three is live. Looking at four. Four is live. Looking at five. Five is live. Coming at six. Six is live. Looking at two. And two is live. Four. Four is live. 
five. And five is live. And one. Six first, six. One and one. Six. Six is live. One and one is live for the five. Five is live. Six. Six is live. Three. Uh, five. And five is live. One. One is live. Two. Two is live. Coming to four. Four is live, five, five is live. Six, and six is live. One, and one is live. Coming to four, four is live, five, five is live. Coming to six, and six is live. Looking to two, two is live. Bringing it on two. Looking at one. One is live. Six. And six is live. Coming to four. And four. Looking at five. Five, five is live. Coming to one, and one is live. Three, three is live. Coming to five, and five is live. Coming to six, and holding on five, six is live. Five, five is live. Six, six is live. Coming to one, four, four, one, and one is live. Three, three is live. Coming to five, and five is live. Six, and six is live. Two, two is live. Coming to five, five is live. Six, six, one, and one is live. Five, and five is live. Drums. Yep, 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 yep. Coming to two, two is live. Coming to six, six is live. One, and one is live. Five, five is live. Coming to six, six is live. Back to five, and five is live. Three, three is live. Coming to four, four is live. Five, five is live. Awesome job, guys. Obviously, it doesn't show the room, just like some lights and pretty things. Five. Five. Six. 
six and six is locked. Nice, nice. Coming four and four is locked. Coming to one and one is live. Five, five is live. Three, three is live. Six is live. Coming to five. And five is live. Looking at one to start. And one is live. Coming to six. Six is live. Five, five is live. Thank you for being there. Five. This will be Emmy. From the three. Uh, five, uh, four, six. Six first. Six first. Six live. Coming to three. And three. Hold there once, check him to five first. Five, live. Come to one, and one. Five, and five is live. Come to six. Six is live. Coming to one. There is no other On the other way. One and one is live. Coming to six. Six is live. Coming to five. Five is live. Six. 
Five, five is live. Two and two is live. Coming to one. Six is live. One and one is live. Five and five is live. Three, three is live. Coming to one. One is live. Coming to five and five is live. Nice. Six, six is live. One, one is live. <laughs> Come to six, six is live. Two, two is live. Come to five, and five is live. Come on, come on, one, one, six, six is live. Good job, one, good job, one. Come to two, two is live. Come to four, four is live. Three, and three is live. Coming to five, five is live. Six, and six is live. One, one is live. Coming to two, two is live. Four, and four is live. Coming to five, five is live. Six, six is live. Two, two. Way to be there, two. One, and one is live. Coming to five. Five is live. Six, six is live. Coming to two. Two is live. Five, five is live. Big one. And one is live. Okay, slow down. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Good reveal. Coming to six. Six is live. Three. And three is live. Coming to five. Five is live. Three. Three is live. Six. Six is live. Two hold there. Coming to five. Five is live. Looking at two. And two is live. Coming to five, then one. Five is alive. Look at one. And one is alive. Six. Six is alive. Five is live. Two and two. Look at four. Four is live. Coming to three. Three is live. Coming to five. And five is live. Six. Six is live. Hold with their one. Coming to two. Two. Coming to five. Five. All right, big move. One. Come to four. Four. One. One. Five. Five is live. Come to six. Six is live. Come to three. Three is live. Go over to Morgan. Four. Four is live. Come to five. Five is live. Come to one. Six. Six. One. One is live. Three and three is live. Come to five. Five is live. Come to two. Two is live. 
one and one is live. Coming to four, four is live. Five, five is live. Coming back to six, six is live. Five is live. Four, four is live. Looking at one. And one is live. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Five and five is live. Coming to three, three is live. Six and then one, six, six is live. Coming to one and one is live. Five, five is live. Four, four is live. Six, six is live. Five and five is live. Give it a one and one. Nice landing, one. Nice landing. That was a great run. Literally in camera two's place. <laughs> Coming to two. And two. Little Dutch, a little heavy on the left. Twist it to the right. Wide one and one is live. Six and six is live. Jesus at the center, Morgan. Three, three is live. Be enthroned in our praise. Be enthroned in 
can I worship? We can do one. And one is live. Lift up the song. Oh, they got the you. Of the lyrics. Six. If Six is live. To your king. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, it's good. We adore you. Do you have, you have a have to have a prism, right? Two and a five. Five is life. No. Oh, all right. One. In the of the one is life. Coming to two. So two is life. The center of it all. Jesus at the center of the world. And six is From life. beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you. I see you one. Jesus. Hang out, Jesus. hang out on six, come to one. One. Jesus be the center nice. Of the there you go, there you go. Good that you got Jaden. Yep. The center of we have a quota. Keep it going. 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 Coming to three. From beginning three to the end, it will always be. It's five. always been five slides. Five slides. I thought I just test out that reveal. Jesus, Coming to four. Three slides. Three. Matters. Nothing. The six and five. Oh, yeah. Six Jesus, is live. The center, five. Five is live. And everything revolves around you. One. Jesus, and one is live. At the center five. Of five is live. Looking at four, four is live. Follow to Morgan. Oh Jesus, be the center of my life. Jesus, be the center two, two is live. Looking at five life. and five. One is live. Five. Five is live. But a six. Six is live. Three and three is live. Five and the two. Five is live. Two is live, six, six is live. Coming to one, one is live. Five, five is live. Four, four is live. Coming to six. One is live. We got five on an electric. And five is live. Two to one. And one is live. Six. Six is live. Come to two. And two is live. All right, we're not big yet, but we're gonna go. We're gonna go big. Coming to four. Four is live. Coming to five. Five is live. Back to six. And six is live. Two. Two is live. Coming to 
and five. And five is live. Come to one. One is live. Coming to six. Six is live. Two, two is live. One, one is live. Good speed on one. Come to six, six is live. Five and five is live. Picking it up, picking it up. Come to three, three is live. Come to six, six is live. We're not at 100 percent just yet. Come to four, four is live. Come to one and. One is live. Five. Five is live. Coming to six. And six is live. Two. Two is live. Three. Three is live. Big one. Coming to five. Five. One. Down, 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 down. One. So Jesus be the center of your church. Jesus be the center of your church. Tight on three. And three is Every knee will bow. And every tongue shall confess Good follow, good follow. Come on to five. Five is live. Let's sing that again. Oh, Jesus, be the center of your church. Come on to six. Six is live. One. Jesus be the one is live. I have the same thing on two, three, four. And every and knee will bow. One, uh, five, five is live. There we go. Three, three. Jesus. Two and a six. Six is live. Two and a five. Five is live. Coming back to two and two is live. Coming to four, four is live. Looking to five and five is live. Looking to six, six is live. Coming to two and uh, three, three is first. Okay, speaker. Three is live. Coming to one and. One is live. Coming to five. And five is live. Six. Six is live. Coming to four. Four is live. Coming to five. And five is live. Coming to six. And six is live. One. And one is live. Coming to five. And five is live. Six. Six is live. Three. Three is live. Big on one. Five. Five. Hold it. Six. Six. One. And one is live. Five. Five is live. Coming to two. And two is live. Coming to six. Six is live. Four, four, three, three, five, five. Four is live, four is live. Come to five, five is live. Six and six is live. Two, two is live. Slow down and one is live. Three on speaker. Four and. Nope, three. Three is live. Why don't you just stop whatever you're doing in your living room, in your car? Why don't you just focus in? Maybe you're cooking right now. You're listening to our service. We love our Bethel family. Little wider? We love our global yeah, family. I want us to just take the next few moments and really connect with what we're seeing. Staying on three as long as she I really love, specifically um, in addresses Colossians the camera. One. I've been reading this every day over my life, over my family. I've been actually singing this very song. It says in Colossians 1, He is the image, this is Jesus Christ, of the invisible God, Ooh, the firstborn two. of all creation. Two's life. 
For by him all things Three. were created, <laughs> both in the Three heavens five. and on the earth, yep. visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, oh, and authorities, all you, things have been created go back into worship? through him and he did say she was for go back into him. Yeah. He is Got it, again. before, he is before gotcha. all Coming things, to one. and in him and all things hold together. So I want you to just think about your life, think about your kids, think about Four, your marriage, think about your finances, and, think about your job, think about three, your church, think about your emotions, think about your beliefs, and I want you to ask Jesus to come so and be the worship. center of it all. Looking at one. I want you to just ask Jesus be the center. If there's anything in my life that is taking precedent over you today, Jesus, I put you at the center. I want you to the center of my thoughts. I want you center of my belief system. I want you at the center of my heart. Jesus, we return to first love. We return to first love, Jesus. We simplify it all back to you, God. <laughs> Come on, sing this Five and Just take a moment. Five is live. Confess him as Come the center. Four is live. six. And six is live. We're going to two. Two is live. Thank you, two. Yes, it's all about you. From my heart to the heavens. Two and five. Jesus be the center. Five is all about you. Yes, it's all about you. Six and six is live. Four, four is live. Yes, it's all about a one. Five birds. Five is live. Give it a one. And one is live. Come in a six. And six is live. We're going to five. Five is live. Uh, three, uh, yes, two, and two's live. Two to six. Six is live. Three, go ahead. Go. Uh, two, no. Uh, sorry, one, and one is live. You just can't hear her very much, so I just want to come to her. Five, five is live. Coming to four. Four is live. Coming to one. And one is live. Two and two is live. Coming to five, five is live. Coming to four, four is live. Come back to six, six is live. Five, five, one and one. Reveal perfect. Coming to three and three is live. And you are the Lord of all. And right now I just invite you peace of God to come into your home, to come into your heart. When Jesus is the center, when he's the king, when he's in his rightful place, the government of peace has no end into every area of our lives. So we just thank you, Jesus, that you are the prince of peace. And right now, the, the peace of God is coming into every home, every family, every situation, every One. nation across the earth. Jesus, One we five. declare you are Lord of all. You are Back holding three. all things together. Three By five. your word, you hold all things Remember together. Remember, one will so want to be drifting out whenever we go peace, to our Knowing video. that God, you are on the Four. throne. You are on the throne. Four is live. So we can be at peace because Jesus is on the throne. Uh, I'll count. He so that's is the play. king. He's the king. Let him be the king two, right now of your life. Let him be the king of your life. Two is live. Home. Coming to three. Let him be the king of your situation. Three is live. Just receive his peace right now. Just receive his peace. Thank you, God. Thank, thank you, God. Two, well, thank as you she's for closing, I get off the stairs just so you don't get one shot. King Jesus. But that was great, dude. He yeah. really is worth it all. He is so worth it all. He is making the nations continue. They are bowing.
before the name of Jesus. He has the name that's above every name. That's in Philippians 2. Uh, can you pet up at all? He three? really is our victorious king. And so why don't you just um, yeah, receive and his peace right now, receive slide. his love. We're going to have an incredible service with right Chris Ballatin yep. in just a moment. Yep, yep, yep. We're talking about <laughs> the God of transformation. Thank you for joining us in worship. All right, here we go. Coming we bless our one. Bethel family hold across on, the globe. On, on. We're so grateful that you've joined us to worship our King this morning. Now we're going to check out some church right. news. Wanna what's coming your way? God one bless. is live. Coming to church news. And three, two, one, church news. I hit auto, but it cut. Did I hit cut? All right, there we go. Family. Whoa, we, are we got a the holiday year, and we have several volunteer opportunities to share with you. No, we're, we're good. We need volunteers There's like double audio, right? For Not anymore. But yeah, for a second. Be sure to sign up on the link below to volunteer, or you can bring any food items you'd like to donate. You can begin dropping off your food at the back door of the Bethel Kitchen until 4 p.m. today or between 9 and 4 p.m. next show. Our annual holiday feast is coming up, and we need your help. This year, we are creating an incredible drive through experience at our College View campus, so you can come and join us for holiday joy. If you'd like to contribute financially, One minute you can text Bethel Holiday at 94090, so cool. or on your check, you could write Bethel Holiday. The Reading Garden of Lights will be an engaging holiday light show with lots of fun activities at the Turtle Bay Arboretum Garden. We are looking for volunteers to help show love to our community. It's not this doubled holiday. anymore, right, the audio? You can sign Correct. up to volunteer at the link below. Things will look a little different this year, but we will be having our Christmas tree lighting service on Wednesday, December 9th. Sign up to help volunteer to make this a success. You can sign up for the 6 p.m. or 8 p.m. service at the link below. And last but not least, we always want to bless the kids from the mission. This year, we have the opportunity to do this online. By visiting the link below, you will find all the details on how to bless a specific child. All gifts will need to be purchased online or mailed before November 29th. Thank you for your generosity. That does it for church news. Uh, coming out in three, week. two, one, and one is live. Well, church, praise God. How wonderful was that worship this morning? Just three, absolutely phenomenal. Why don't you stand with me? We're going to do this morning's offering. such a privilege to give. I was thinking about this morning as we we're hearing worship and, and obviously getting geared for, to serve you this morning. I think in 2008, I, I used to listen to the Sermon of the Week. Sorry, for I For those who have been online, if you have been long-term Bethel, uh, community that you understand the sermon of the week was the big deal of Bethel TV back in the day. You know, I think about it to this morning, just standing on stage holding this mic. That oh, in good 12 job, years, Andrew. a lot has you happened since being on a bus listening <laughs> to the sermon of the week in Australia, in another another continent of, of the world. And I just want to say this morning, if God can transform me, and trust me, I'm like I'm a long way to be trans fully transformed, but I'm still going. But I'm saying in 12 years, how God has done so much for me. I just got overwhelmed in worship with thankfulness, thinking about he's so interested in getting us to where he wants us to go. And so this morning, I just, just let this scripture cascade over your mind as we do offering reading number one this morning, family. It's from 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. It says this, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in what? All things, all circumstances, all seasons, or whatever it is that you're going through, all things give thanks. So with that, won't you stand on your feet? Such a privilege to give this one. You guys have been outrageous over this entire eight, nine-month journey with us. And we want to say thank you as a leadership team. Yep. Thank you so much for being faithful. And we're going to do offering reading number one just in a few moments. Here we go. Won't you stand and say it with gusto with me this morning. You know, say it so loud that your neighbors hear you. Instead of turn down the music, turn down the declaration. No, 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 no. Let's say it really loud this morning. Come on, let's do it together. As we receive today's offering... We are believing the Lord for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements in states and inheritances, interests and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, debts paid off, expenses decrease, 
blessing and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of my financial needs that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Won't you hold your offering up in your hand or or your iPhone, your iPad or your laptop, whatever it takes to sow into the today. Lord, I just thank you that, Lord, you're so faithful. And as, as thankful givers this morning, we give in a posture of thankfulness and generosity. And we thank you for what you're doing in our global church, not just here in Reading, but all around the globe. People are being impacted by the message of the gospel. Thank you, Jesus, that our seed you goes the, a long way screen, this morning. Yeah. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. Thank you so much, guys. Three, full screen, full screen. Graphics. You want me to give him 50 or 55 minutes? He's got 48 right now. 48 minutes left. We'll be coming in on one. I will. Five, four, three, two, one, and one is live. Well, good morning, Bethel Church. We are so excited that you're joining us today. If you're watching us live live this morning, Um, having a great time. I was I was Uh, laughing when Dave was doing the the, uh, opening of the service, and he was talking about. And we welcome all the people in here, and there's like ten of us. (laughs) Yes, we are small, but we are mighty. Well, before I start, I'd just love to pray. Father, thank you for what you're doing all over the world. And we thank you that you're on the throne and that you are the leader of nations. Lord, you're the king of every king. You're the Lord of every Lord. And you have everything in control. And not only that, God, but you said that all things work together for those who love God and who are called according to his purposes. So we thank you, Lord, that even when we are daily trusting you, and can't see the future, that the future is already worked out for the benefit of everyone who loves you. Amen. Well, we have a series going, and this is the God of Reformation. We want to talk about Reformation. And I want to talk about the beginnings of Reformation and the, the core values, if you will, the way that Bethel sees the world and the way that it came to this place, at least my journey, and I think my journey will explain some of our journey, about exactly like what is it we're doing, what is the vision, and how do we become a part of it? I, I, we, uh, Bill and I, and many of our team, got saved in the Jesus movement, which was a beautiful movement. I got saved in 1973, in June of 1973. I was 18 years old, and I so loved the Jesus movement. As a matter of fact, I didn't even know it was a Jesus movement until 15 years later, and someone um, said, you were saved in the Jesus movement. I'm like, I was. And uh, the, the motto of the Jesus movement was actually in that. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, where Paul says, yeah, come out from the midst of them and be separate. Do not touch what is clean, unclean, and I will welcome you. That was our motto. Like our motto right now, and we'll talk more about it, is on earth as it is in heaven, well, the motto of the Jesus movement was come out the of the midst of them, be separate, Before. and do not touch uh, what yeah, is unclean. Okay. And, and we were very much um, all about the rapture. We went to conferences that talked about the rapture. And by the way, if you went to prophetic conferences in the Jesus movement, they weren't talking about how to prophesy. It was about, it was about charts and I remember going Tyler, to many prophetic conferences where the back wall would be no, this long chart that, of course, we didn't have all this uh, technology in those days. And it would be a chart okay. about Sorry, when support. Jesus was returning. Swap. And we oh, were identified by, a, you were pre-trib, yeah. meaning you were the rapture, you believe the rapture was going to happen before the tribulation. Or you were mid-trib, meaning that the rapture would happen in the middle of the tri- seven-year tribulation. Or you were post-trib. That you meaning that you believe that the rapture would happen after the great tribulation, and basically, um, and basically the 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 whole emphasis of the Jesus movement. I don't want to say the whole emphasis. 
because the emphasis was on loving Jesus. But our eschatology and the way it affected our daily lives was very much wrapped around the rapture and the tribulation. I remember uh, reading the book, The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey, and talking about that Jesus was going to come back in a certain amount of time. And, <coughs> and that, of course, that book was, uh, you know, edited several times, so Jesus came back Is several different times. Good? Yeah, that's good. Um, kind of the on, ongoing joke. But um, and I remember uh, receiving a cassette series. In those days, we listened to cassettes. And a, I remember, I think it was a six or eight uh, uh, message uh, cassette series. And I remember that one of the tape cassettes was, uh, I think it was entitled, How to Not Take the Mark of the Beast. <laughs> That's a true story. How to Not Take the Mark of the Beast. And, it was, and uh, I listened to that whole series, and that whole tape message was about the mark of the hey, beast Michael, and how you weren't going to be able to buy or sell horses. It's all in the book of Revelation. And how to convince your children to sure die and live bag. eternally and rather than take the mark of the right beast the and live in damnation. And, and I mean that the okay. core feeling of the Jesus movement was love for people what, very deep. That was, that was, I have to say, that was a hallmark of the Jesus movement. But also a lot of fear. There was a lot of fear. And so many things were uh, happening right now. around the Jesus movement to in the world. Then yeah. if, you, if you think about it, the, the foundation of the information age was blossoming your, um, at the same time as 400? the Jesus movement. Oh, yeah. Let's and bump it to I think that it's important to understand how the mentality then, of the, the rapture, I call it the rapture mentality, was affecting our daily lives. For example, obviously I graduated yeah, from looks, high school in 1973, the same year that I received Christ. What's your I never went on to high I never went on to, to college or university because we thought the rapture is going to happen anytime. And what you believe about the end has everything to do with how you behave in the like middle. Come down to and so we were, we were looking up and we had bumper stickers that said, in the case of a rapture, you can take this car. There was all kinds yeah, of like, 32. this was not like relegated to one group of people or, you know, just, uh, just, the, just the, like the Jesus people. It's actually, it actually, the, the entire, most of the church embraced this mentality, and I'm sure there was some that didn't. But um, what's interesting is the mindset around the rapture, actually, and the idea uh, cool. that we were to be come out of culture, like the goal like was to come out of culture and be separate. That was, that was the reigning cool. mindset of our day. And I want you to, to see for a moment in just one small area how this affected our actual, uh, in, if you will, yeah, our impact on cool. culture. It was intentionally, we were intentionally removed from culture purposefully on, on our part because we felt that Jesus was going to return any time and therefore our goal was to get people saved but to stay out of the dirty cesspools as we thought of them of, of culture. Interesting, here's some interesting information. I was born in January of, of 1955. Um, Steve Jobs was born the same year Bill Gates was also born the same year. William Joy, the founder of Sun's Microsoft Systems, who was also another very prominent founder of the information age, was born in November of 1954. And I can list a whole bunch of people, some that you would know well, others you wouldn't know as well, who were actually the founding mothers and fathers of the information age, who were, who were actually in school at the same time I, I was, went on to go to, to be in university. Some of them didn't graduate. I don't think Steve Jobs graduated. I can't remember if Bill Gates did. But many of these guys and gals, they began, they became the founders of the information age. And consequently, what's interesting, you have to ask yourself, like, why were there very few Christians at the foundation of the information age? And think about it, you know, Bill Gates, I, I'm, by the way, I'm not judging anybody's relationship with God. I don't actually know you know, who knows where they're, they're at with the Lord. But these people were definitely, you know, Bill, 
Uh, Steve Jobs was a, a Buddhist. I think Bill Gates is probably an atheist. I think he's a professed atheist. That may have changed. Uh, Bill, uh, William Joy, I think same. So the question becomes, like, why were there very few Christians in the foundation of the modern information age and in the modern age of technology? And I would like to say that Christian young people were looking for the great escape. And so there was no forerunners in the Christian age because we were not forethinkers. We were looking up and not looking out. And consequently, you look at how the impact, that, and I'm only talking about one small part of society, the impact that the, that the rapture mentality had, the waves of that mentality are still being felt today. We talk about Google and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Oftentimes people are, are think about how um, maybe I would call it liberal. I'm really not talking about liberal or conservative from the standpoint of politics. I'm talking about their values, their moral values, and how their moral values line up oftentimes so much with non-Christian and anti-Christian views. Why is that? Well, because in the foundation of those companies, and we're talking about now 45, 50 years ago, Christians were not seated into the foundation of those companies because when everyone else, when, when the world was having foresight, we were having upside. We were looking up and waiting for the big rescue, and consequently, we were removed from culture. The other thing that happened, or one of the other things that happened, is that, is that we began to be removed from the morals of culture. And in 1973, the same year I received Jesus Christ, Roe versus Wade passed. And it passed without a big uprising from the believers because we were looking up. We were like, hey, this place is going to hell, and we're going to get out of here. And, and our debate was, is it going to happen before the rapture? Is the rapture going to happen before the tribulation, mid-tribulation, or, or after the tribulation? And we actually were looking forward in a weird way to the destruction because we thought in the last days, the world's going to get darker and darker and the church is going to get brighter and brighter. So we actually created an eschatology for things to get dark and in a strange kind of perverted way, now that I see it this way at least, is we are actually celebrating the cesspool of evil, seeing it as a sign of the return of Jesus. And consequently, if you will, the world did get darker and darker. We had self-fulfilled prophecies as we built a theology around our lack of connection to the world. You know, what we believe about the end has everything to do with how we behave in the middle. I've used this example many times, but if I had a 55 Chevy and you had a restoration shop, and I took my 55 Chevy to your shop and said, listen, I want it to be restored perfect. I want it to look like the day it drove off the showroom floor. I don't care what it costs. I don't care how long it takes. And halfway into the restoration, I go check on it, how you guys are doing. And, I, and while we're talking about the restoration, I say, when you get this car done, I'm going to put it in the destruction derby. There's just no way that the quality, let me say this, it's going to be a greater challenge for you to do great quality work when you know that the end of this restoration is destruction. And so we have lived, I grew up in Jesus in this mentality of destruction. It's all going to burn anyway. It's all, it's all going to burn. And we would say that to one another like, We'd, we'd have a bad day, we'd go, ah, it's all going to burn. It was our mentality. You're having a problem with somebody, you're like, don't worry, it's all going to burn. Somebody, something goes wrong in, in life, you know, Roe versus Wade passed, and we're like, ah, don't worry about it, it's all going to burn. We're going to be out of here. Jesus is rescuing us. We're getting out of here. And 
I think you get the idea that coming out of that many years later, I began to realize, and many, not just me, but those of us that were old enough to have experienced that core value could see honestly how destructive it was to culture and how irrelevant we became to people who desperately needed the kingdom. And so we began my journey, of course, is Weaverville. By the time I got saved and ended up in this little town of Weaverville, I met a man named Bill Johnson, who you may know. If you're watching this, you probably have heard of him. And I would uh, bring all these revel revelation, not revelation like heavy revies, I mean like the book of Revelation, scriptures to Bill. And by the way, the conferences were still going on when I got to Weaverville, these prophetic conferences. And people, I remember, <laughs> I remember it's kind of a side note, but I remember going to this one conference where, you know, at the time we had phones that uh, had a dial. It was a dial phone, like you actually had to put your finger in and dial. And, uh, and the invention of the push button phone was just coming out. And this, this guy did this whole thing like, like all the prophecy teachers did about with the map. And I don't remember if he was pre, pre or post or, you know, and they all had different ideas about who the Antichrist was. I remember that the Antichrist was the Pope for a long time. And then, uh, and then the Catholic Church got the baptism in the Holy Spirit and started speaking in tongues. And we're like, oh my gosh, how could the Antichrist have the <laughs> Holy Spirit? And they started coming to our meetings and we're like, the Antichrist is invading our meetings and and then, you know, we have all these, yeah, I mean, it was really, it was, it was crazy. And we, I mean, this is our glasses we had on. We're like, we're looking for the Antichrist. We're looking for the two prophets in the book of Revelation. And so this guy, he's, uh, he's, he's sharing about his ideas about the end time prophecy. And he uh, showed a picture of what was a prototype of the new phone where it didn't just have the buttons, uh, the, the um, you know, the numbers, but it also had a star and it had a, uh, you know, a number sign. And he said those number signs and stars were for when you have the number on your forehead that you could actually still buy off your phone. <laughs> he didn't even know about Amazon, so he's partly right. But I remember leaving those meetings just terrified, like, oh my goodness, you know, uh, this is, you know, we were the baby boomer generation, but we decided to uh, not have children. Many, many people decided to not have children. I wasn't one of them. But, you know, there was a big move to, like, um, you know, woe to you that have children in those days uh, is one of the Matthew 24 verses. And so we were very much like, well, should we have children because they're going to have to take the mark of the beast? And, and you could even see the birth rate decline in those days. And so this is all, like, how powerful is it what you believe about the end? How powerful is that? And and it becomes a lens in which you engage or don't engage culture. So I meet this, this crazy Jesus freak in Weaverville named Bill Johnson. And for whatever reason, like Bill didn't teach on eschatology, like, which was kind of odd. Like, I, 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 we, I, we never talked about the first show? couple of years. And I noticed that Bill, you know, used the book of Revelation on, like only in a positive way and I would bring him all these cassette tapes about, you know, yeah. the phone, our phone systems are rigged and we're all going to hell. And Bill would be, thank me and I'd say, did you listen to that? And he goes, no, nah, I don't listen to stuff like that. And Bill started preaching this message of the kingdom. And I, I remember, I don't know if I remember the first time because I've heard hundreds, literally thousands of messages that Bill preached. But I remember reading the Lord's Prayer with Bill in, on a Sunday church, which was, our church was, you know, at its height was like 250, 300 people. And reading the Lord's Prayer, our Father who's in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I, I you know, we prayed that prayer in the Jesus movement, and there was a fulfillment of the return of Christ and beating the devil. We read that verse as if, we're going to pray this for thousands of years, and someday God's going to fulfill that promise when he defeats the Antichrist and throws the beast into the lake of fire and, you know, and so on and so forth. And Bill's having us read these verses 
verses that we've read before, and he asked the question, like, should we believe that God wants it to be on earth as it is in heaven? And I'm like, yeah, after the beast. And Bill starts talking about the kingdom and how Jesus preached the kingdom and how he told us to go everywhere and preach the kingdom of God. And how the book of Revelation talks about the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God. And, and it, it was, you have to understand, for some of you, you may not agree with this teaching, but this is popular teaching now. Like, this is the prophetic training of the, of the Jesus movement is, it is on earth as it is in heaven. And we begin to ask ourselves questions like, are we supposed to impact culture? I remember, this wasn't that long ago. Um, well, let me back up and say this. I can't even tell you how many messages I've heard that included, in the last days, the church is going to get brighter and brighter, and the world is going to get darker and darker. I, I, I honestly, I would... If I even tried to guess, it would be in the hundreds of times I've heard that phrase over all the years I've been saved. And then I started to read the verse and wonder, like, isn't it funny? It says, Jesus, Jesus prayed, told us that you're the light of the world. This is John, uh, Matthew 5:14 is one of the places. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill can't be hidden. Nor does anyone lay a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to the whole house. And Jesus is talking about, you're the light of the world. What are you saying? You're the light of the world. Where is the light? It's in the world. And I, and I began to ask the question, like, I, I, I heard someone preach this message of, in the last days, the, the darkness it's gonna get, the world's going to get darker and the light's going to, and the church is going to get brighter. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, he's reading the verse and misplacing the light. I remember the first time that I ever thought that. I'm like, it says you're the light of the world. It doesn't say you're the light of the church. It says you're the light of the world. And I'm, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, the, the, the passage he's using to make his point is actually a passage that is against his point. Because he's talking about that the church is going to get brighter and the world's going to get darker. And yet the Lord said, you're the light of the world. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, he just read, you're the light of the world. And I had never thought of it before. But Jesus said, no one likes a lamp and puts it under a basket. But sets it on a lampstand for everyone to see. The next verse says, do your good works in such a way that they will see your good works and glorify your father who's in heaven. And I'm like, oh, wait a second. If we're the light of the world and the world's getting darker, <laughs> whose fault is that? And I begin to actually grieve over these passages. I mean, grieve in that I was taught wrong for so many years, and it so changed the effect I was having on not just the broad world, but on my own community that I was actually celebrating bad news as good news in the kingdom. I was actually relegating the world to a cesspool in the name of a rapture that was going to save us all out of it. And I began to get deeper and deeper, and Bill was teaching this. Also, Matthew 28, Jesus said, he rose from the dead and he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now you go and make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of all nations. I, I want to point out a couple of things. First of all, Jesus said, all authority, he, he rises from the dead, and he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now for those of you that have followed us for a long time, this is maybe a little bit elementary, but maybe for some people who are watching us for the first few times and haven't heard us talk about this, I think it's really important to understand what Jesus is saying there. Because the people he was speaking to in first person, his disciples, when he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven, they would have not have been surprised about that. But when he said, and on earth, that would have been a surprising, maybe even shocking verse to the, for, to the people who were actually in that conversation. Because, see, when Adam and Eve 
Adam and Eve were told, be fruitful and multiply. God blessed them. He made them in his image and his likeness. And then he said, be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. In other words, Adam, man, representing mankind, was given authority and responsibility for the entire earth. You know, some people say, this dominion theology. No, it was actually the words of God to Adam. Be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. What happened when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit in chapter 3 of Genesis, as we most will know that story, is that God said, you can eat any tree except for this one tree. Eat the tree of life, live forever, but don't, don't eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And most of us would know that story Lucifer came, spoke to Eve. Anyway, they all convinced Adam and Eve to eat the tree, the only thing God said no to in the entire garden. And Adam eats the fruit. And we've taught for years that Adam disobeyed God and sin came into the world. I would agree that Adam disobeyed God and sin came into the world through Adam's disobedience. Um, That's Romans chapter 5 and 6. But here's the other thing that happened. Adam didn't just disobey God. He obeyed the devil. That's how we end up with the God of this world. Who empowered the devil to have power over the world? Not God. Adam. Adam was given authority over the earth. God said, don't eat the tree. Adam, Lucifer, Satan said, eat the tree. And when Adam disobeyed God, he also obeyed the devil, and mankind came under a new God, the God of this world. So what happened? Because God gave authority to man, to humans, over the earth, the only way for God to get it back rightfully is he, God. This is so crazy, profound, revelatory, and powerful, and yet so well known. God had to become a man. God had to become a man. I love the way C.S. Lewis put it. He said, the son of God became the son of man so that sons of men could become sons of God. He had to defeat the devil as a man because God gave authority over the earth to man. So when Jesus defeats the devil, is crucified on the cross and rises from the dead, and the Bible says, takes the keys from Satan. And he says, all authority has been given to me. Authority, the word, a Greek word, something like exousia, authority. It's like, it's like the badge on a police officer's uniform. The gun would be like, uh, would be like dudamus. That Greek word is the word power, dudamus. He has a gun, but the badge is exousia. It means he has authority to use the gun. He has authority to arrest people. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven. Listen, listen to this and on earth. Therefore, you make disciples of all nations. In other words, authority will flow from you to them. You will make disciples, not just in nations, but of nations. Now, I want you to think about this. That was not a new idea. It was actually the promise made to our father of faith, Abraham. Abraham was told, you'll remember the story probably, Come out and look at the stars of the sky. See all those stars? Count them. Abraham's trying to count the stars. God says, that's how many descendants you're going to have. And then he goes out and says, go, hey, count the, count the sands of the sea. Count all the kernels of the sand. And he's trying to count those. And God's like, that's how many descendants you're going to be. And here's the promise. You shall be a father, not in nations, of nations. The, the, the prophecy to Abraham, listen to this, the father of faith who... Paul says that when you believe Jesus Christ, we were grafted into Abraham, the father of faith. (laughs) This is so crazy. And we received the promises that were given to the faith father were now ours. Let me read it to you. In Romans chapter something, 4, verse 17, listen to this. Speaking of Abraham, a father of many nations I have made you in the presence of him whom he believed even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. In hope against hope, he believed that he might become a father of many nations according to that which was spoke. And listen to this, and so shall your descendants be. 
so shall your descendants be. In other words, the, the original promise was to Abraham that you were going to be a father, not to Israel, but to many nations. And by the way, that legacy is going to flow through your descendants so that your descendants will be fathers of nations. So profound and powerful that we were called to be fathers to nations, mothers to nations. We were to have authority in the nations. This was, remember, so we go back like in Genesis 1, be fruitful, you were made in the image and likeness of God. Be fruitful and multiply and take dominion of the earth. The, 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 the story, the Genesis story, Abraham encounters God. God re, again redefines the Genesis 1 commandment, or if you will, promise to man in Abraham, and you shall be a father to many nations. Jesus comes on the scene. He, re, he, he, he reignites the promise that was started in Genesis story, was confirmed in the Abraham story. Now he's saying, I have all authority. <clears throat> and here's how it's going to flow. It's going to come through you, and you're going to be, you're going to disciple many nations. You're going to teach them everything I taught you. This, this, in my mind, is so powerful. It breaks the rapture mentality. Do you believe in a rapture? I, you know, I believe that we're going to be caught up with Jesus. The Thessalonians says that. But I'm talking about the mentality that takes us out of culture and has us not give a darn about what happens to the world in the name of God. And I believe that the Bible teaches that we were to go everywhere spreading the kingdom. That we were to go everywhere spreading the kingdom. And that we were to make disciples of nations. Isaiah 61, I'll just quote a couple of these, was a, a passage that I received early on, uh, both obviously in the Bible, but as a prophetic declaration over me. As a matter of fact, two of my grandkids tattooed it on their bodies. They actually called me and said, Papa, what is your... Do you have a model verse? Yes, the Lord gave me this verse, these verses, when I got saved. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon you, Isaiah 61. And the Spirit of the Lord God is upon you, for the Lord has anointed you. To preach the good news to the afflicted, to bind up the broken heart. Speak release to captives, freedom to prisoners, the favorable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to grant all those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, a mantle of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness, that they might be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. That's the third verse. That's one through three. The fourth verse goes, then they shall return. Who? All these broken people. The delivered, the healed, the restored. Those who were depressed and got joy. Those who were mentally ill and got healed. Those who were captive and got freed. And then they shall return. Then they shall rebuild the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastation and rebuild ruined cities. What is the outflow of personal salvation? It's, it comes in you to heal you, and it flows out of you to heal cities. <clears throat> I could go on and on about verse after verse after verse that tells us that we were called as people who were here to reform or transform cities, that we are the light of the world. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 21, in his, in, in his name the nations were put their hope. He who gives the most hope has the greatest impact, the greatest influence. What is actually happening? I wrote a book called Heavy Rain. I've shared this message many times. I wrote a book called Heavy Rain. And before I wrote that book, we were doing some research. I was doing some research, and I had this encounter with the Lord. This would be about 20 years ago. And the Lord started talking to me about apostles. And, I, and I'll just give you a three- or four-minute overview so we don't take a bunch of time for this. But, and I started realizing, and through this encounter, this revelatory encounter, then the research I did that, uh, after that, that apostle, first of all, the word apostle in the means sent one. It was actually, the, the, the word was invented by the Greeks, and it, uh, and it, was, later, uh, it was later embraced by the Romans. The Romans, um, they were people who, especially in the first century Jesus was in, and, and a little prior to that and way after that, 
they were kind of like Hitler. They wanted to, they wanted to rule the world. And so they were conquering lands and expanding their kingdom. But here's what they learned. They would take over a land, like let's say conquer a city, then a next city, and then a next city. But when they went back to the first city they conquered, the people, even though they were conquered, they would go back to their old ways. And you know the adage, when you're in Rome, do as the Romans do. So the Romans like, why are we conquering lands and cities, but we're not culturizing them? So the Romans were the ones that picked up this Greek idea of apostle, and they took the word apostle, and they made some of their Roman generals apostles, like they actually called them apostles. Now, the word means sent, but it actually has a greater connotation, which is why they, why they actually named their Roman generals apostles. It means to be sent from a place to another place, to reproduce in the place you're sent to what you're sent from, till the place you're sent to looks like the place you're sent from. We would call it cultural transformation or cultural reformation. So they named some of their generals apostles, and when they sent them out to conquer, they sent out, of course, the armies, but with them went the artists and the politicians and the teachers and the trainers and, 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 the, and the singers. And the point is, is that they would conquer, but then they would culturize to the Roman culture until what they conquered looked like Rome. Remember, Jesus and the Israelites were under Roman rule at the time. So when Jesus promotes his disciples, meaning learners, to leaders, he could have called them, he could have called them many things. He could have called them patriarchs. There was 12 of them, and there was 12 patriarchs in the Old Testament. The priests, there was a whole Levitical priestly order. You would have actually thought that he would have called them priests because that was the term for the kind of holy people that led other people. But instead, he takes this really secular idea, or at least title, and he says, you, to the disciples, you are my apostles, and he names the first 12 apostles. Now, you and I, it, it's not as meaningful for you and I because the word is kind of become a holy word, but in their day, it was actually an active word. It was like, this is your job, that you would, that, that you would take the kingdom, and you would internalize it, the kingdom within you, and then you would spread it. It would become the kingdom around you. And then he doesn't just name them apostles, but he gives them an apostolic prayer. What am I talking about? The prayer we all pray. Think about it. We pray, our Father, not my Father, who's in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Where are we seated? In heavenly places with Christ. What's the goal? To take heaven, <laughs> the goal, what's the prayer? Is that it would be on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, we, we, our, our whole emphasis is getting people to heaven, but the emphasis of, the, of God and the emphasis of the prayer is to get heaven in people, to get the kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. And what I'm getting at is that when I was writing the book Heavy Rain, we did a statistical study on only American cities. Now, this book was probably, uh, it's probably 10 years old, 12 years old. And we did a statistical study on U.S. cities, American cities. And here's what we learned. The cities that had the greatest Christian church-going population had the worst social statistics in our nation. In other words, the, great, the larger, the, the, the more percentage-wise Christians went to church, the more crime increased, divorce rates climbed, poverty index rate will raise, unemployment rate goes up, drug use goes up, school dropouts rate go up. I'm saying most pastors think if people came to church, it would transform my city. But actually, what the actual statistics show that the more people that go to a Christian church, the worse off the city is. I didn't say the worse off the people are in the church. I'm saying that the worse off the people are in the city. I call it the huddle effect. Jesus said, no one takes a light, puts it under a basket. Remember, I'm the light of the world. Then he said, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill can't be hidden. What I'm getting at is that 
We believed that the church was going to get brighter while the world gets darker. And the church became a basket in which the church gets brighter while the world gets darker. And we did it proactively. It's a self-fulfilled prophecy. And we measure success by how many butts we put in a seat on a Sunday morning. And still, instead of how, how much impact we have on darkness. And I'm saying that this, this has to stop and that we are called to be an apostolic church in an apostolic age. The devil would love for us to believe. Don't be involved in anything that affects the world. Should Christians be involved in politics? I mean, for us that are Americans, I mean, just read your constitution. Just look at most every major document in American history is based or at least infused with the Bible. <laughs> and today we're like, we don't want those crazy Christians here. And we can talk about you know, why that is someday. Because I think that when we're trying to Christianize the world instead of kingdomize the world, that we're controlling people instead of building an empowering culture where people can actually be fully actualized. And so that's, uh, that's what we need to, to talk about. There's so much to say, and I have about 15 minutes to finish. One of my favorite verses is in Daniel chapter 7, and I'm just going to leave you with chapter 7, verses 9 through 27. But Daniel sees a vision of the future. And he asked the angel of the Lord, what does this vision mean? And because of time, I'm just going to give you the outflow, the interpretation of the vision. The angel said, the saints of the highest one will receive a kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever for all ages to come. And then he goes on to say, when will the kingdom, when will, those, when will those receive a kingdom that lasts forever and ever? In fact, let me just read you this part. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom to all peoples and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Daniel said, what does that mean? And he said, the saints of the highest one are the ones receiving a kingdom and that are possessing a kingdom that lasts forever and ever and has dominion for all times. And the question becomes, when do they receive a kingdom? And the answer to that is, when judgment is passed in favor of the saints of this highest one, and the time arrives for the saints to take possession of the kingdom. Listen to this. The court sat for judgment, and his dominion, speaking of the devils, would be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty and the dominion and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people, the saints of the highest one. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, which will not pass away, and all dominions will serve and obey him. What I'm getting at is this depicts the time when Jesus dies on the cross, he rose from the dead, he destroyed the kingdom of darkness, and he gave dominion, a kingdom, and glory to his people. Remember John 17, Father, the glory you gave me, I want to give to them that they might be one. And what's the message that he gave us? Go out and spread the kingdom everywhere you go. We've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his marvelous light. We have, it's the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom, and so we're living in a time we call the kingdom of God. We are an apostolic church, so let me, let's talk a little bit about the practice of an apostolic church. We're an apostolic people who are commissioned by God to shape culture, transform cities and nations, and bring heaven to earth until the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our God. So number one, we must ditch the vi victim mentality and start thinking like royalty. I mean, start thinking like royalty whose father is God, the God of everything. I, I, I gotta tell you, like, we have to ditch the victim mentality. We are not a subculture. We are a counterculture until the cultures of the kingdom, until the culture of the kingdom infiltrates all of culture. We are not a subculture. We are not sub to someone else. We are a counterculture. <laughs> I mean, we have all authority. We are not victims. We have to break the victim mentality. Number two, we have to think we and not me as we've been, as we've been in leadership and as we are being given leadership and responsibility for a city. Let me try it again. We have to think we and not me as we've been given leadership and responsibility of a city and of a nation and of states and so on and so forth. But I want to talk to our people right now specifically 
You know, the, our, the, the Lord's Prayer is our Father, not my Father. I was talking to a man, we were flying, um, this is a few months ago, in fact, I've only flown twice since, uh, in eight months, I think, or maybe three times, and he was a former uh, fighter pilot in Afghanistan, and now he flies for FedEx. And we were just talking about the pandemic and about mass and all that, and anyway, it was a longer story, you know, it's just, uh, like, we don't know, you no longer say, it's nice out, the weather's nice, isn't it? What do you think about the weather? Now it's like, what do you think about the pandemic? So we have one of those conversations. And he just made this observation. It was, he was, he's an American, and he said, I fly to Japan, my route is Japan. My, one of my main routes is Japan for FedEx. And he says, and everyone wears masks in Japan. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah. He said, they have a we culture, and we have a me culture. In, in America, it's all about, is this helping me? But in Japan, it's all about, is this helping us? And by the way, whether you wear masks or not, you know, do they work? I don't know. I mean, that's not the argument. I'm talking about the mentality. The mentality. We have to move away from, it's all about me, and it's all about how, how much benefit it, you know, it, it has on my life and, and the things I care about. We have to, if we're going to be, if we're going to be fathers and mothers of nations, we have to bring in this we culture. How does it affect the people around me, not just me and my three? We're apostolic people who are called to shape culture and be cultural architects. And there's a war over who gets to shape history. Number three, because we're leading a city and not just pastor a church, we don't have the privilege of thinking like leaders who are just leading a pastorate. I'm saying... There is such thing as a pastorate. There are uh, apostleships, what we just described. Apostleships are people, are leaders that actually are, are, have a mandate from God to train, equip, and deploy their people into culture to train, to equip, I'm sorry, to mold culture, to have, to bring the kingdom into culture. And by the way, I want to say, just so I don't forget, we can't bring, we can't, come into culture as invaders. We have to get that language out. And we're invading, you know, her, heaven's invading earth. I love that book, by the way. I'm talking about the mentality. It's like we must come through invitation, not intrusion. We must demonstrate the power and wisdom of a superior kingdom so that we get invited in as Joseph did, as Daniel did, as Esther did. In the Old Covenant, these are people that worked in Gentile nations who would have been seen as evil nations from the perspective of the Jews, and they actually came in invitation from the king. And by the way, very difficult to throw rocks at the palace and be invited in by the king. You know, uh, I had this metaphor come to me this morning. We, uh, we have jet skis. Actually, we don't have them right now because our grandkids blew them up lately. We have jet skis, and if you've ever, uh, you know, been on a lake or whatever, you, you have this area that's uh, where the harbor is, where you come in, there's these buoys, and you have this five-mile-an-hour area. And if you come in on a jet ski at 20 miles an hour, in the buoy area, in the five mile an hour area, you're probably, you're definitely guilty of, and should be ticketed. But not very many people are going to feel the impact of your offense. <laughs> on the other hand, if you have a ship, a big ship, and you come in, you couldn't even do this on the lake, but you come in to a harbor at 20 miles an hour and you're supposed to be going five. It's not about whether or not you deserve a ticket. It's about how many of the other boats are going to survive your wake. How many boats are you going to overturn with your offense in the harbor? This is a very challenging season for everyone, and everyone's trying to navigate what's the best way to find success for the kingdom, for my family, for our congregation. And Bethel's a church of 11,000 people. There, there are lots of larger churches in the world and in America. We're, we are not pressing becoming the largest church. We're not, we're not close to being becoming the largest church. We're not even trying to be a large church, to tell you the truth. Bill, Bill always says, I don't care 
how many people come to this church. I just care we obey the Lord. But the interesting thing is, we are anomaly in that we're a church of 11,000 in a city of 90,000. That's kind of like trying to turn a ship in your swimming pool. I'm not in any way, by the way, I'm not in any way bragging. I don't think you can measure success in the kingdom by how many people come to your church on a Sunday. I think that's the point. Like, you can measure success, if you measure success by how many people come to church on a Sunday, you have the wrong measurement. The kingdom doesn't measure its impact like that. Think about Jesus. Jesus preached the messages in which he had crowds, thousands were following him, and he preaches this message about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and they all leave. And here's, here's my point about values. He doesn't do anything to go, hey, I'm not actually talking about cannibalism here. Hey, come back. I'm trying to say, you know, you got to take part in my body. You're part of my... He, he doesn't try to explain. And his disciples are like, what a bad message. <laughs> Just destroyed the church with one message. Offerings are going to be low next few weeks. Now, he doesn't, he doesn't measure success by how many people come into a building. So anytime Bethel does anything in our city, it has a big impact. How We have to understand how our behavior affects the well-being of our city. Uh, and, uh, and listen, I, I, all I'm trying to do today in this final part of this message is to talk about how do we actually transform a city. You know, the two-thirds of my message is that we are called to because so many people fall and they still don't understand. Like, why are you guys trying to transform a city? Why don't you just love people? It's like, that's what we're called to. Read Isaiah 58. Read Amos chapter 9. All these verses I didn't do today. You know, it's so what Bethel does, and by the way, there's other churches in the same, all churches are powerful. Uh, everybody that loves Jesus is powerful. I'm not trying to make, Bethel's so, so much more powerful than anyone else. No, no, I'm talking about the particulars of gathering this many people in a city this size and how much more difficult it is to decide what to do in the pandemic, for example, because if the goal is to do your good works in such a way that people see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven, and more metaphorically speaking, you come blowing your ship into the harbor at 20 miles an hour, and you don't care that the other boats are turning. You're capsizing other boats because of your actions. And I'm saying, if we were this size, and we were in San Francisco, or New York, or Sacramento even, or, or L.A., and you're a church of 11,000, and what you do is mostly affecting the people who come to your church. And the effects that you're having on culture are there, if you will, they are diluted by how many people are there. You know, if you put a little bit of uh, urine Jerry, in a shot glass, you, no one's going to think about drinking yeah, that. But you put the same amount you know, in your swimming pool, it's like no, almost undetectable. And I'm simply uh, pointing receiver. out Where's from the standpoint of impact... That what we do, it's is, it, on it, on, it has a greater well, impact just, on our city, be it good or bad. Who is doing backstage passes at so the So people send us letters every, every day. I get several. I know Eric and Canis, by the way, doing a fantastic job. They're getting, they're getting their share also. So is Bill. So people are like, why don't you open? Like, we need to open. And I'm pointing out that it's the, the decision that we face in this apostolic mindset of how are you impacting your city. And by the way, we spent 21 years building in our city, helping our city, sending 2,400 students into our city. It's important that we, what we do impacts our city in such a way that people see our good works and glorify our Father who's in heaven. i give you an example. You know, we, this year, we... Of course, this is before the pandemic spiked in our city. We have our school ministry, and we decided to have it online and on campus. And last year, we graduated almost 2,600 students, 2,500 and something. And this year, we, no. we, we interacted with the health department, no and they way. said, listen, you've got to social distance. No. You have to put, you know, wear masks. And they gave us um, several. We worked out this plan with them so that we could have about 1,600 students. So about 1,600 students came to well, the school ministry, and we had to have them quarantined, so we did that. 
But we started thinking, listen, we, it, it's not just about optics. How do we keep our city safe? We have 1,600 students coming from I don't know how many countries this year, 50 countries, maybe 60. And how do we make sure that we keep our city safe? So not only did we quarantine them for 14 days, which was what required, but we also tested every single student. Guys. And, if they, and I think there was eight or nine who tested yeah, positive. I thought there was none, but there was eight or nine. And uh, all of those students who tested positive, and by the way, we tested them three days before they came to school, so they would have that, that germination time of the virus. And anyone who tested positive had to be quarantined. They came to school, and at school Taco they Bell got party. the temperature tested, which was not required. We social distanced them. We put masks. Everyone had to wear masks all day long. They had to fill out, when they checked in at their checkout station, they had to fill out a form that basically asked them, like, have you had a fever? Have you had any symptoms? If the answer is yes, they were sent home. And all that to say that uh, a month and a half or two months into school, there was a breakout in our city. All right. And we about 38% of left. those for about so two weeks about were our students. To 20 and we had to develop we'll tracking service. teams. We had to develop care teams so our students didn't have to leave to get medicine or food so they didn't yeah, spread it. I mean, all of this had to happen quickly. We had never been in a virus before. So it took <laughs> us probably a month and a half or so it working with the health surprise. department and developing a team, <laughs> developing a strategy. How do we stop this? And we found out that our students, yeah, he mostly did. they didn't catch... I think we had just a few that caught the virus as we tracked inside our public meetings. Most of them caught them at, in their homes, which we were not prepared for. How do we, we, they don't have dorms. And all that to say, the Taco impact, party. that impact that that had on our we city was like tremendous. And the impact that it had on our students was, was even crazier. And what happened was that our students <laughs> began to lose their jobs, not because they were actually were carrying the virus, but because there was a couple hundred of our students that were infected, the newspaper caught wind of it, they began to blame Bethel for the virus, and of course, spreading the virus, of course, part, that was partly true. So our students were seen as lepers. And they couldn't, many of them couldn't even use their laundry facility in the apartment complex, and they began to be ostracized, and we, you know, the city council, mostly the board of supervisors began to speak against us and call us out, and business leaders were you know, saying, you know, Bethel doesn't care about people, and on and on and on and on. And my point is, is that even though we took all these safety measures, because our, some of our students got sick, and there was a spread, and that was all true, people thought we didn't care. They began to, they began to redefine 20 years of ministry through the lens of infected students. They began to say things years, like, you guys don't wear masks there when we're actually completely wore masks. People, and by the way, people. we canceled what? 32 conferences and, and, and we, uh, the most loved we, place. we went completely on, almost Dude, completely online. You, the only meetings we had were outside. The um, still to this day, I'm, I'm yeah, doing this, I think this is what, month eight or nine in the virus. We've oh not seen a gathering Premium. of our people except for I think I four it. times on the lawn or five times on the lawn. And just, we're not doing, by the way, it's not about complying with the governor. It's, and it's not about optics. How does it look to the city? Dang it. The no, no. Didn't Those are important to people through. who don't actually have an impact on the city. We're not a jet ski. What we do affects it's and could infect our city. Must have and so the good news is, is, that, set to go past um, is that in the last, I think it's been three zero. or four weeks, so We've had no new infections. I think of all of our people are out of quarantine. And there was a big spike in our city uh, this last calls? three weeks, four weeks. And Being we were participating in none of that. We, as far as we yeah. know, there was no students and no staff sick in that outbreak, like, um, which we're still, we're still having you know, like right the, now. Even like our um, calendars. Where like am I going? Let me, I need to land this right? because we're but running out of time. Like what is like I want to say the Roman that clock? Who it's important that we carry system? a kingdom mindset. You know? Paul, you probably know. Should we open? Should we close? I'm know. just, I'm just sharing this as one example if there's something of in this world that Paul something know, current okay in which that. we are carriers of the kingdom of God. Our message is God cares about you and loves you. It's hard to preach one thing and have a negative effect on our community in another. Should we open? Maybe we should open. Maybe we will open. In next week, next month, was, six months, three the, months, two months. The calendar, we, the calendar we use right but now. I want you to understand in an apostolic yep. 
house, uh, but in the an clock, apostolic the movement, it's not clock. just about really how do we keep me and my three healthy. It's about how I, I are we impacting it, so culture, and are we, are, are, is our city and, and actually Egypt having a positive benefit from us being so in our city? Clock. Were the sundials 12 hours? Other yeah. churches are opening, and they should. If uh, God tells them to open, they should. Yeah, they use Several a 12-hour sundial to tell the time of the day, and then they have a 12-hour water clock. They feel like the church is essential. I feel the church is essential, too. The question is, clock? is the church essential? Yeah, they should use those at the question night. is, at least oh. in our city, is how the does Roman an essential church minister in a way that brings healing to a city and not create more so damage? Is it the Egyptian those clock are the questions. Or the now, clock? You, you may not agree with the decisions we've made or the Roman, like to this point. Well, yeah, but but those are the core well, reasons which why is also we made weird. those they weren't decisions. On the equator, because so we want to be the light on a hill. We want to bring Maybe good works in the way that people see those and glorify our Father. It's not about the fear of the people. It's about the responsibility Time. that the Lord has given us to be people who restore ruined cities, rebuild ruined cities, and bring the kingdom everywhere we go. If you want to stand right now, I just want to pray for water us. Clock is like okay. a funnel that they'll fill it with water and it'll uh, drip and it'll take 12 hours for it to... How long, like, when did we start doing them, those, like, little sand timers? How long ago was that? Lord, I just thank you yeah. for this what mandate that you've put you on the church on the worldwide. Yeah. That we are to be the light of the world. A know. city set on a hill we'll get it that can't be hidden. We're to do our good works in a way <gasps> that when people mean. see them, they glorify our Father who's in heaven. Father, we are to bring the, the power of God and the wisdom of God in a way that causes people to invite us, Backstage. if you will, into the palace or into the conversations about how do we walk through this virus, this pandemic? How do we, how do we solve the issue of fatherlessness? How do we, how do we take so care of this, this issue of, was used of, in France of in abortion and century. all the things we're going through? Lord, we just pray right now that you would release so courage water clocks and, and wisdom on the body of Christ. And Lord, that you would give us the mind of Christ and we would know what to do in this hour. Amen. God bless you. Thank Second you so much one. for listening. I just pray that your house would be nope, so blessed. Three. It would be like Obed-Edom's house when the Ark of the Covenant was parked in his garage and it said that everything he did was blessed. I pray that everything you do would be blessed. You'd be like Isaac who sowed in a famine and he reaped a hundredfold. God bless you and I be powerful and, and we just we pray for your, the well-being of your family. One, one, five, and five is live. Wow, <laughs> that was incredible. And I, I just hope that every one of you um, feel the love of God washing over you and also the encouragement of God. Mm -hmm. um, cool. That hey, scripture yeah. that kept coming out throughout the message was, yes. was from Matthew where Jesus says, you are the light of the world. You are a city on a hill um, that cannot be hidden. And we just really believe that today, God has taken the bowl off of people. He's, he's removed any beliefs, whether it's victim mentality or just feeling alone and hopeless. Right now, I really believe that the Holy Spirit is coming into your room and has come into your room to remind you, hey, you are the light that will light up your business, that will light up your city, that will light up your healthcare practice. Wherever God has placed you, he's anointed you to shine bright. Yeah, I love that Chris reminded us of our authority that we've been given from heaven to earth. We are, we've been given authority in heaven and on earth, and it's our rightful place to come and lead in this time and to bring the kingdom to earth, bring kingdom to our spheres of influence, to our families, to wherever we work. We have a huge passion that yeah. people realize that the church isn't just about gathering in a place, but it's about getting out into the world, into their workplaces, into their families, and seeing the kingdom of heaven come in those areas. So I loved that yeah. Chris reminded us of our authority in that today and challenged us to uh, just be the light and yeah. get out there. You know, only 3% of believers are supposed to be in you know, employed in 
ministry around the church. Most of us are called to be out there being ministers and apostles um, in our businesses, in our homes, in our cities, wherever God has placed you. And, you know, we believe that God has anointed you for this. And it's super easy. Like we have testimonies coming in from like healthcare professionals yeah. blessing their surgeries sure, before the because the Lord said, hey, I want you to shine a bit brighter there. And they bless their surgeries, even amongst colleagues that don't necessarily believe in God. They do it in such a gentle and loving way that many of those colleagues have found the Lord and miracles have happened just so beautifully. We have business people that bless their businesses, bless their staff, even the staff that don't know God. And God is is pouring out favor on their business, but also their friends and their, their colleagues that don't know the Lord are encountering the Lord. And today we just want to encourage you, if you need prayer, um, jump into a chat room in a moment. If you need to know Jesus for yourself so you can become the light of the world, um, jump into one of those ministry rooms. And we have incredible friends that want to pray with you today. Yeah. And I just want to challenge you all to just pray with the Holy Spirit and say, Father, what is it that I'm supposed to do? What is my step of action? How am I supposed to advance the kingdom? What is something that I can do personally in my life, in my workplace, in my family, that I can extend the kingdom of heaven into those areas? So I challenge you to pray about that this week and see what you can do. We also have um, our midweek oh, service not. on yeah. Wednesday. It's continuing the series, Future yep. Ready. This week we have Lauren Valentin who will be wow. hosting a panel of people. So please join us for that on Wednesday. Uh, otherwise, we just want to bless you guys. Here have a great we week. Go. We just pray that the favor of the Lord is upon you yep. and that you receive the blessing of heaven in every moment, every day, and just feel the pleasure of the Lord for you this week. In three, two, one. We are out. That's a wrap. Come back for Taco Bell. Come back for Taco Bell.